Hi, everybody. I'm Eddie Brill, and we're here at OG Talk. And OG stands for, you know, many things, including the Organic Grill, which is where we're at here in New York City in the East Village. I'm here with the owner and uh, impetus behind OG Talk, and that's Vladimir Greenberg. And there's hey Vlad. And uh, we appreciate all the good stuff you do for the community here in the East Village of New York and around the world. And uh, we have our guest today, uh, comes all the way from uh, the other side of the table, um, <laughs> our good friend Peter and uh, Cervoni, Peter Cervoni. And he's one of the geniuses behind this incredible product, uh, the Plant Made Tuna. Now, I know that sounds crazy. The company's called Good Catch, and we'll get into this more. There's all different kinds of tuna in a pouch, and boy, is it delicious. And we're all going to try it. I mean, you're not going to try it now, but uh, after this, you'll <laughs> run out and try it. It'd be weird if you had your own tuna with you while you were uh, going, yeah, That's we have our tuna. Yeah, the future is you, you like the tuna. It shows up at your house immediately. Things are doing, you know, with Amazon now, it's you done. know, yeah. Hello, I'd like a ding dong. You know, so how did you know what I like? You talk, you start watching, and tuna comes just. That would mind. be fantastic. Right. <laughs> so yeah, and that's the next podcast. So, um, so Vlad, have you tried any of this tuna? By the way, I did try the tuna, and full disclosure that I know Peter for more than twenty years. Right. Um, and uh, at one point, Peter even was a chef here, and he went to to be a um, consultant to many companies and he finally ended up uh, working for a good catch and uh, trying to uh, working on different recipes and I did try it I liked it okay and I actually went to a plant-based conference and I tried it there. it was a huge success I saw people standing in line yeah well that's one thing about food if it's good people will stand in line for it yep you know and that's what they do to come here at the organic grill in fact we have to record it when no one's around uh just so we can you know because this place <laughs> is always packed with the most amazing characters um so you know peter we're glad that you're here and Thank representing the me. company um a, a little bit about you you know um we were talking before so i was gonna f uh, have a little um <coughs> Discovery, but I guess you're from Scarsdale. Is that where you're from? Uh, actually, born in, in uh, Bay Ridge, but ah, okay. uh, but my uh, my parents moved up to New Rochelle when I was one. So right, so you were like the Dick Van Dyke family. You exactly, went, and went actually, actually lived uh, one block away from uh, well, a few blocks away from where they filmed uh, on Bonnie Briar Drive, Bonnie right. Meadow Drive, where uh, Carl Reiner lived, and right. that was the uh, there used to be a plaque right on the. I think it says Dick Van Dyke Way now. Ah, so yeah, nice. so we were the uh, yeah. So he lives in Bay Ridge. I'm from Bensonhurst. Awesome. Yeah, so we were neighbors, maybe. I think I might be a couple of years older. And there's no plaque of me or you. Right. Not, yet. No, not, not, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, there'll be tuna. And there'll be plaque. I have plaque here. Plaque. I yeah, I was going to say, we all have that <laughs> kind have of that, yeah. That's where that goes. So you, you moved to uh, New Rochelle. So what was the uh, family life like for you? Did you have brothers, sisters? Uh, yeah, great family life, thank God. Um, bro uh, I'm the oldest of three. Younger sister and brother. Um, my parents stayed together until my dad passed a, a few years ago, so they made it to 50 years. Um, and just uh, uh, and blessed to live in in the suburbs and have New York at my uh, New York City at my fingertips. You know, a quick train ride into into Manhattan. And you know what's interesting out there? A lot of people in this world don't take risks, and we know that. Of course, you know, we take risks because we're making changes in the world. But some people who live 20 minutes away and never make their way into the city. Right. Some people are at the Dairy Queen in Long Island singing Billy Joel songs going, I wish I was in the city, but right. never make it. Never make it, it's <laughs> yeah. true. Yeah, in fact, I was just, I, I take Metro North and all the time, and I realized that it's the first time I went in by myself, mm -hmm. I was 11 years old. Yeah. So, wow. you know, with a bunch of my friends. So I've been taking that train for 40 plus years. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's been, and it was great. It was it was great growing up there, and uh, had great friends as we were de describing. Um, a lot of uh, uh, my block was half Italian, uh, you know, so half Roman Catholic and half Jewish. Right. So um, not only were we interacting, um, you know, uh, socially, but uh, there was also a lot of uh, food right. transference, like <laughs> going over there to like, you know, going over my friend Stephen's house to have bagel and lox for the first time <laughs> and them coming over to my house to have sauce, you know, sauce. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so it was great. And food was, a, you know, just as in, in the Jewish tradition was huge in the Italian tradition, too. So um, and it's and I think for everybody, it's really the first time that you experience love. Right. It's the first time, you know, your mom feeds you or your dad feeds you. And it's like 
you make that immediate connection that there's, you know, it's sustenance and, and, and it's a way of showing love. And that's why I love being a chef because it's just one, one other opportunity, one other conduit for me to express, express love. So that's great. And, you know, with that sort of, um, memory sense memory of everyone having a good time, there's also textures and smells. You walk down the street, you have you smell pe the food that people are cooking. When you enjoy the foods, there's textures, and that I'm sure comes into play later on in your life when you have to, you know, create food. Uh, you know, and again, we won't get into the tuna right away, but you know, to get the the certain sense of smell and the textures in it, it has to. There's an emotional attachment to Absolutely. that, and it's very important. So now, uh, the other thing that, to lead you into where I'm, my devious plan uh, is, okay. uh, and so did, there were a lot of pets in your neighborhood, probably. Did you have dogs and cats? And No, we were, um, uh, I think my brother and my father were allergic, so mm. um, we, my sister has dogs now, um, but yeah, there weren't a lot of pets in the neighborhood, actually, That's if I think about it, yeah. No cats or... Yeah, no. Well, Mr. Katz, he was the neighbor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Katz. Yeah, he was there. Right. Uh, yeah, no, no pets. And the reason why I ask that is because I, I think about the world of veganism. There's a compassionate element to it that really drives the whole bus uh, of it. And it's about animals and, you know, the treatment of animals. And, you know, I grew up in that we had everything. We had, I had dogs, cats, birds, fish, um, everything. I had, right. I had a duck. Wow. Yeah, Quacky was the duck, and I mean, I've had every, everything. And you, you didn't grow stretch up, too much on that one. No, no, quacky. no, All Quacky right. was so, you know, <laughs> I'm three, you know, what am right. I, you know. Okay. I was creative, but, you know, Quacky was easy. And I think there was a cartoon character where the duck was named Quacky or something like that. I had a lizard, and we called it Lizzie. You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> how I ever became um, involved in the entertainment world, I don't it's, know. <laughs> it's, but, but, but it's interesting how we can grow up in a world of meat and eating animals, yet have them in our houses, our loved ones, our friends. What's your feeling on that? Uh, it's a really good question. I didn't, my epiphany did not come until um, many years later. Actually, I think it was being a chef. That's mm -hmm. what really accelerated my uh, making the connection. And we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, yeah, peep, there's there's a serious disconnect. And in fact, I keep saying this, and maybe one day I'll find out. I could swear it was a special on HBO. This is mm -hmm. going back. Um, I was right out of culinary school. So it's only maybe a year or two before I, or maybe a year before I become vegan. A buddy of mine, uh, and we, we had, uh, it was a double date. It was pouring rain. The girls didn't want to go out. So we went to a local place and got, I think there were 32-ounce prime rib. We got four of them, baked potato, the whole nine yards. We sit down. He had just gotten this big screen TV, so we're watching TV. And I could, like I said, I could swear it was HBO, but I might be wrong. And it was a documentary. So somehow, and, you know, as guys, I don't know how one of the girls got a hold of the clicker, because that's a guy thing. <laughs> so she's clicking, and all of a sudden there's this thing of, like, these cats. So they're like, oh, so they're looking at the cats. Next thing you know, the, the camera pulls out, and it's a restaurant. I think it was Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And... They're taking the cats and they're skinning them alive. Mm. So it was really freaky. And then you sh it shows you that it's a restaurant. And it was like these little vignettes. So like the next one is um, this woman talking about somebody, Jim or something, and talking about how close she was with Jim and this and that going on and on. Camera pulls out and it's the pet cemetery actually in Hartsdale, not far from where I grew up, which was the inspiration for the Stephen King pet cemetery right. thing. And then you realize, wait, this lady's talking about a dog. Right. And that's when I first started making that connection of like, yeah, what is the difference between why, why are we, you know, sitting there screaming because these people are eating cats? And then why is this lady crazy for talking about a dog like it's her husband? And why is it okay for me to be eating 32 ounces of a slab of cow? So, um, yeah, there is that disconnect. And I don't know if having pets would have... Not Whatever. only that, like you would go to jail for uh, uh, animal abuse if you got forbid uh, uh, abuse a dog or a cat, right? But right. but people are getting paid for killing cows, right? And that's a actual business killing cows, right? And they can have a store, and nobody consider it abuse. I never really understood the cows. Well, you know, there's a lot of that in life. You know, like you 
you know, you tell someone in, in religious school that thou shalt not kill, and then you send them to war, right. and then they kill, and then they come back and they go, well, you have to stop killing now. You know, there's all of that. There's a lot of, all through life, there's these questions that, you know, we have to ask ourselves. And, you know, it make, you know, that's, we evolve as humans, and that's how we grow. At, I mean, that's how we learn. You know, uh, when I was little, I, you know, everything, I didn't, I would sit there with my dog and, you know, maybe feed it scraps that fell underneath the table or things like that. You don't think about that. It's right. not, that's not the way we were brought up. And also, we live in a society that's built around money. And even in the vegan community, you, you, you're not having products without making money. You're not getting involved without making money. And there's, you know, there's money involved in the meat industry and the dairy industry. And they're not going to sit around while the vegan community takes away some of their business. They can either be smart and get in that business and start making money. But I always think about this. If everyone was going to be healthy, tens of millions of people would be out of work. You know, soda is there's nothing good about soda right. for humans yet i loved soda and i you know have, would just have so much of it yet if we said okay no more soda well that wouldn't happen and tens of millions of people would be out of work i mean i agree t i agree with that to a certain extent i mean it's almost it's it's very similar it's analogous to what's going on with the coal industry mm -hmm. it's like yeah, there's people are going to be displaced, but let's just find them new jobs. So right. maybe all the Coca-Cola people, or I don't want to mention brands, yeah. but maybe all the soda people um, start juice companies. Right. You know, so switch all those jobs. So if I mean, you know, we we're we're, we're blessed to have Juice Press here, and and right. I worked for Organic Avenue, which was the forerunner right. of all I the remember. cold press juice companies. So you know, we have them in small pockets. But right. what happens if 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 Big Soda mobilized and just started saying everyone's going to start drinking green juice now? Or apple, you know, fresh pressed apple juice. So we'll find jobs. But for it, those there people. is nothing new to this. We we've been facing it on a daily basis. Look uh, how many retail stores closed because Amazon took over, right. and in, not even Amazon, just internet commerce, right? And uh, we are facing the reality that it's going to be uh, self-driven cars, right? And right. how many drivers are going to be out of work? So progress is going to to give more. A ways of uh, employing those people and there's going to be no uh, new opportunities with uh, uh, Amazon taking over look how many people are having uh, their own small businesses that th they would never have before or Etsy came about just because right. uh, big retailers went out of business so yeah, that would be the ultimate it would be uh, the ultimate if, okay well you were a heroin dealer now we're gonna put you in another job yeah or you can <laughs> grow right. pot now legally yes right yeah, so yay, <laughs> we're, we're figuring out. All right, right that's here. a different show. Right? Yeah, <laughs> we'll be right back after that one, you know. Oh, we're back. Um, yeah, so there's, and also the, the government subsidizes bad food. That's what they do. They, you know, they, they get money for dairy to, they give money to the Dairy Association. That's the government right now going, See, you uh -oh, can't uh -oh, shut uh -oh. it down. <laughs> yeah, shut them down. That, you know, the government does subsidize the dairy industry and they don't subsidize you know the the, the healthy industry. food right the broccoli yeah. industry yeah, but this this thing i i was trying to do some research and it came about as a really good intention by the government to to help people after um a depression air to, to 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 get another <laughs> call from the government <laughs> uh, depression air to to kind of uh uh sustain their families and not to go completely uh, hungry all day long. And yeah, no, the for idea is agriculture good. was what? Meat and dairy. And it never changed, obviously, for specific reasons, but intentions were good. It just never, never really got to to evolve. The same with uh, GMO. It was designed to protect harvest and look where it brought us now. Right. right. And that's, the, you know, they're all good arguments. And, you know, again, it comes down to money and the people are don't want to give up money. People are, are, you know, they and I understand, you know, again, in the vegan world, you know, people will always come back at you when you talk about it and they'll say, well, you know, the vegan world wants to make money. Why can't we make money? Of course, should all make money, but not at the risk of people's lives. Right. I think that's that. So now um, one of the things that you do, you leave. Um, New Rochelle, uh, our, you, you graduate high school, you decide what you're going to do for your life. What's your first 
kind of decisions? What are you thinking about doing for your career before the chef's uh, business came about? Were you? Uh, it was pre-med because my father ah. was a scientist. And uh, what kind of scientist was your dad? Uh, believe it or not, ph- uh, he was uh, he was a pharmacologist and a toxicologist. A very famous one too. Yeah. So um, so that I thought was going to be the the path that I was going to go on. Did and, you do it for a while? Um, I think I was pre-med the first two semesters. And Where'd then, you go? Uh, Fordham, Fordham okay. University in the Bronx, the Bronx. <laughs> um, and I did that for a while, and then it just wasn't for me. I ended up getting like a C, I think, which actually, in hindsight, was pretty good for yeah. pre-med, but um, I didn't want to do that. So I ended up uh, majoring in poli-sci and mm-hmm. then went to uh, St. John's Law, where I was promptly put on academic probation after six months, and I decided <laughs> and why, that was not for me. Why did? Why was that? It was it. You just didn't. It just care. wasn't for me. Yeah. Right. And it's. Uh, I think I failed two of the five exams, and then I had to like write a letter to the board to say like, why should you? What you know? Tell us why you should stay here at St. John's Law. And I'm like, I shouldn't stay here. Right. So I left. Um, but all the years from from the time I was 15 years old, I had always worked in restaurants ah. as a waiter, as a bartender. So I was working at this one restaurant um, in Scarsdale uh, called Albanese's. A big shout out to uh, to John and, and Sandy and all the people, that, the huge family that worked there. And um, I used to, I was the only waiter, and you'll appreciate this as a, as a comic. You know, one, uh, I was the only waiter and there was there was seven other waitresses. So I immediately caught on that like one way to a woman's heart, uh, not only through food, is through humor. Right. So what I would do is we had this old school Italian chef, Nello, God rest his soul, um, I used to put that guy through hell. So, like, in the middle of dinner rush, I would put an order in for, like, two Big Macs and just, like, watch him read it and then ah, start screaming and throwing that's stuff. That's so funny. Now, did you have a relationship with this guy, Nello? Was it a, at, at any point, were you friends with him? or was Oh, it we were a, always friends with him, yeah. Right. But it was just, like, I was young. I was 20 yeah. years old. So it was just, like... And I'm, how old was know, he? Oh, Nello was probably in his... 60s right. at the time. Yeah. Like this kid. Yeah. You could get this kid off my yeah, back. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So one day it just got to the point that I had just I had just annoyed him so much that he um, he said that he wasn't gonna cook family meal anymore for the for, for the, the restaurant, yeah. So the girls were like, you know, that was really funny tonight, but it's like you gotta go make us food. So I went back there partially so I could do my impression of him because he used to wear his apron very high. So I'm back there doing my Nello impression and started and making... And doing well, killing. The audience is loving it, right? Yeah, they're loving it. But then I was like making food and I had just really observed him for, for all these years making stuff. So I started making the food and then I remember one... And the girls loved it. And then one night the owner comes down and I'm like, oh my God, he's going to be like, why are you back there? Where's Nello? What's going on? And he was like, it smells good. Why don't you you know, make me some? So um, mm. it was at that point, and they knew that I was struggling, like, okay, I, I failed out of law school, what am I going to do now? And they said, why don't you go to the Culinary Institute of America? Not knowing there's like 400 culinary schools. Wow. They said, go to the best one in the, definitely in the country, probably right. the world. Well, they obviously liked what you were making. And right. You, and you, you know, what was your thinking when you were in that time? You were, you know, because you're not thinking about it as a career. You're thinking about, well, you know, having fun and I want to do this. And so what was the thinking behind your cooking and what were the kinds of foods you were making? It was really just making um, the food that was that was on the menu. So it was very uh, old school, traditional, like Italian American stuff. So like Parmesan, everything and mm-hmm. baked clams and that kind of stuff. Um, and then I used to I used to go and make pizzas, too. And in uh. fact, I wish I could claim this. But I, I came up, this is 1984, of putting cheese in the crust. Ah. Like putting cheese on the outside. And right. So whoever, whoever took that pizza, yeah. somebody, I don't know. Um, no, I just enjoyed it. And then I started realizing, like, it is, it is fun. I do enjoy being back here. I do enjoy mm. making food taste good. Um, and I did like the immediate response, like whether it was good or bad. Um, and so they said, go to the CIA. So I applied. The CIA? Yeah, the, <laughs> okay. the, the cooking one, not the okay. killing one. <laughs> um, so I, I applied, and I got in right away. And I remember thinking, like, wait, I don't know if I want to do this. So I went, and um, the first two or three months, you're, you're, um, it's just classroom stuff. Maybe the mm-hmm. first two months. You don't even really go into a kitchen with a knife. It's all culinary French, culinary math, culinary history. 
So I said, you know what, I am, you know, because to, to, to make up for fouling up law schools, like I'm getting A pluses all the way through. Right. Which Plus was, you loved it. This is a, a topic subject you loved. Right, but the thing is, is that, you know, I kind of fudged my application. Like, I said that I had all this kitchen experience uh, when, like, maybe I had been in, behind the line, I don't know, a dozen times. Right. So, um, I really didn't know what to expect. So, the classroom stuff, I'm slam dunking stuff left and right. And, like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm already at this point in my late 20s. Right. And you, you said know. culinary math? Did, yeah, did so I... just doing your, your measurements and then uh. and cost and, and recipes and costing our recipes and... and um, scaling up recipes so that kind of stuff very basic math very right. basic french but you you took to it yes yeah. absolutely but then the first day that we go into the skills kitchen and i'm like sitting there with my knife and trying to do stuff and i'm like oh wow i didn't really think this through like i don't have a contingency plan right um but i said all right you know what i'm here let me do it and i ended up becoming pretty proficient at it picking up on it uh pretty quickly so did you have a good group of uh folks that you were in school with and i did yeah, yeah. and as you and can imagine helps. like it does it definitely does but you as you can imagine like especially in the restaurant there's a lot of characters like those right. are the future characters like the that. future nellos yeah of the, the future world. yeah <laughs> um and and it was and it was great and and what i always say too is like you know i ate a pretty standard american diet and it was very narrow in terms of what i was eating in terms of different meats and fish and things of that nature but I come out of the Culinary Institute, and it's like, you kill it, I'll cook it. Mm. My first job at the River Cafe, it was like, you know, we had pur- purveyors bringing in alligator, bison, buffalo, right. bear. Um, first time I ever cooked sea urchin. I mean, it was, it was, it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and it, challenging a bit, right? For stuff oh, that, that you never was, cooked before. That was an extremely challenging job on so many on so But many you levels. probably enjoyed it. You probably got a kick out of I it. I did, yeah. I, d- I definitely fed off of that kind of adrenaline rush. So... Um, but still, at that point, still had not made the connection between what I was preparing and where it was coming from, mm. or making that you know that uh, that heart connection. Because being in the entertainment industry of, of which is you know which food is is a big part of it, it's fun, and you're you're having fun doing it, and and it's the afterwards that you're hanging out with all your friends and the people that you work with and the new people you're meeting and. You know, hey, you know, come, Peter, come hang out with us, you know, after the thing. Right. So you're in that period of your life now, and mm-hmm. you're probably maybe partying. It's a big partying maybe is, part of yeah. your life. Yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> so what was that part of your life like in, in that, uh, you know, in because, you know, it's there's a certain point in your life where you go, you know, I'm having fun, I'm partying, I'm having a good time. And then you get to the point where it's like, you know what? I want to get serious about this, and I've got to put that away. Did you have fun? Did you work at other restaurants, or was it just the River Cafe? No, the River Cafe was for about a year and a half. I mean, fortunately, I think a lot of my partying days were behind me, which is a good thing because that's part of the – I mean, that's a sport, you know, in the the culinary uh, world. And there is usually no distinction between, like, you know – I mean, I saw people, like, doing cocaine, like, on the line. Mm. You know, like, for instance, that – uh, line the, on the line. Lines on the line. Yeah. Um, the sh- on Saturday night, the chef would leave two cases of of Budweiser in the walk-in to say, you know, this is for the whole staff at the end of the right. night. And I remember my buddy and, uh, and I one night, you know, the the shift was it's over. All the stories you're gonna, people are not gonna go to the restaurant. Yeah. Now. Well, it's a great. It's a, still an amazing yeah. restaurant. But we we went in to get our beer at the end of the night, and like, almost both cases are gone. So we're like, how? How's that going on? And we couldn't see it. So finally, the next Sunday, we start paying attention. So someone will say, oh, I'm off the line. I got to go get some stuff out of the, the walk-in. So they would shotgun the beer, put the beer on the, the can <laughs> on the floor, crush it, put it in their pocket, come back with carrots or whatever, and just throw the can in the thing. So I'm like, we are working with drunk people a whole night. <laughs> Knives, fire, all this other stuff. So um, yeah, fortunately, most of my partying days were behind me. But it was still, it was still an active part. It was that social thing part of it is because you want you you enjoy it right but the other thing is is that you know you finish a shift at 1 1 a.m in the morning and you're wired you're you know it's like you you know we're just talking the other day about uh, blue ribbon kitchen um which is all over the city now but the two brothers started this restaurant for chefs coming out of restaurants finishing their shift in new york at like 11 o'clock at night right so it was uh it was a big part of the 
part of the scene. Yeah, same with comedy. You know, you finish at one in the morning yeah. and you're wired and right. you stay up all night and, you know, it could kill you if right. the, the partying, uh, you know, did kill a bunch of people I know. Absolutely. And, and luck, in my luckily, business too. Yeah, and that's what happens. So now you're you're rocking and rolling, you're moving and grooving and right. you're, you're doing stuff and you love what you're doing. You I know? do. Yeah. Yes. You're really, you're really having a good time and now you start, when do you make the switch from, you know, cooking bison to maybe going to you know the organic uh, uh, what was the name of the place with the juices organic avenue organic avenue right. rock down to organic, <laughs> organic avenue. avenue and then uh, and uh, Angelica's where you know a lot of us in this neighborhood in the East Village went to where was what Absolutely. was the change and how did that occur uh, so it's very interesting because it ties in with this whole fish free phenomenon <laughs> excuse me um I'm at a country club in Bronxville. And, you know, when you work the line at places like the River Cafe, I also worked at Le Cote Basque for a little bit and ah. then did staging all over the city. What's that? Staging is basically you work for free. So you, they're checking you out, you're checking them out. Gotcha. So you work for a day or two um, on the line to, as like, almost like as an interview process. So I was kind of bouncing around from restaurant to restaurant trying to figure out what I wanted to do. But in those restaurants, especially because, uh, you know, you're using really expensive cuts of fish and what have you, you don't touch the, 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 the big filet. So the mm -hmm. salmon comes in and it's a butcher who takes care of everything. You just go pick it up and you saute it or however. It's, it's like the, the union menu. guys. Hey, you don't go near that. Line, right. You don't you know? touch that. You do yeah. this. Right. So um, but I take this job at um, this country club in Bronxville as a sous chef. And so now as a sous chef, the responsibility for butchering falls on me. Mm -hmm. So one day and it's right around i think it's beginning of april when it when it happens is soft shell crab season mm -hmm. so the chef comes in he's super excited hey it's soft shell crab season he plunks down all these crates of soft shell crabs now i had cooked them before at the river cafe but they had already been butchered and they were killed and like i think they used to soak them in milk mm. uh to tenderize them or something but um so now i have to clean them Right. So under running water, you have to take these things and, you know, maybe just a, a week or two before they've shed their hard shell. So the only way they have to protect themselves is with their shell is gone now. So they're defenseless. So what ends up happening is um, you have to take under running water with a paring knife. You've got to pull their eyeballs out. Oh, great. You've got to flip open their shell and pull their lungs out. And then right. the final insult, death blow, is you flip them over and you pull their gonads out. Right. So all the while, though, they're trying to defend themselves. So it's right. kind of like these little pinches kind of thing. So um, And so, to some people, it's okay that, you know. Oh, it's totally, yeah. yeah. It's you don't like, think about is, it. Like, right. This is what I have to do. I was a fisherman when I was a kid. And, you know, you catch the fish and you, you, know, you fillet it. You get it ready. You stick the guts in with tomatoes and garlic and onions. Throw mm. it in the thing. And it's, mm, mm, mm. Right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And, and. For that first maybe two dozen that I was preparing, that's really what I was focusing on. Am I doing this right? Because I've never done this before. You know, I want to make right. sure they're clean properly and everything. But after the first few dozen, I just started getting this chill running up and down my spine. I just told the story at the plant-based thing because mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, that was my, we you know, this, the red moment. was an expo moment. that just went on. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the first, uh, first ever, ever at, the, at, the Javits. at the Javits. Yeah, yeah. my friend Ben Davis, whose father... Um, does uh, um, expos and, and conventions professionally he's like dad I'm vegan I want to do a vegan one so it was amazing yeah it's the first it's gonna be you got to come to the next one without oh, a doubt yeah so um so that's the first time I make the connection and I asked the chef I was like chef I'll do anything else you need today I can't finish these crabs he's like what's the matter I'm like and I didn't tell him this at the time but it was right. like running through my head like this is wrong I can't do this so that was the the red pill. What I say, like mm, I was yeah, you know, right, like into yeah. the matrix. Like I couldn't, I can't, I can't go back. I'm, I'm going down the rabbit hole. And then I think the final step was maybe a week or two later. I was roasting veal bones. That was one of the things I excelled at as a saucier. You know, you always have to have veal stock in the house. So twice a week, I would make, um, I would roast off 400 pounds of of uh, veal bones. And I just remember taking all the veal bones, they're all ready to go, like in these massive um, roasting pans, ready to go in the oven. And I remember asking the chef, like, do you, much, you know how much a baby cow weighs? And he's like, you need this information now? <laughs> like, come on, let's go, you know? And I was just like, no, I'm just trying to think, like, these all, this all came from an animal. Like, what happened? Like, you know, could we reassemble one? 
and and that's the that mm. was the and then I went Chills. right back to the to that maybe that year before when I had seen that that movie or that documentary or whatever it was and I was like yeah why is this okay and I was like I'm just one small restaurant in one town and then you you start I just started going back like you know this is Westchester New York United States it's like all over the world and I was like it's I thought it was madness yeah so not long after that I was like that's it I'm done and I wasn't actually going to stay a chef. I didn't really know vegan, new vegan restaurants existed. Mm. But so my, what year is this? Do you this remember? is, yeah, this is, uh, I made the decision March 15th, 1997. Wow. Um, and then a few months later, and ironically enough, um, it was a buddy of mine from the River Cafe who had actually first introduced me to tofu, this guy, Jim Delfino, awesome guy. Right. Um, he knew that I had just become vegan because he, I think, had been vegetarian maybe his entire life. And he said, why don't you come, uh, come with my wife? Let's go to the East Village and, and get some vegan food. He's like, get the Zagat's Guide and look through it and pick out some places. So I, I originally picked out Hungawi. You're right, which I love as well, oh, Hungawi. Hungawi. yeah. Yeah. But um, he and his wife are not really like, they're, they're not crazy about mushrooms. Mm. So... They said, let's go to Angelica Kitchen. We love Angelica Kitchen. So I went in there. I absolutely fell in love with the place. Um, it did help that I, I immediately fell for the waitress who was, right. uh, who was serving us. Um, and then what happened was is that I just I kept going back to Angelica. And fortunately, my sister, none of my friends wanted to, the, you know, they were, they, they thought something was wrong with me. They thought right. I, some, I got hit on the head. I understand. My mom was the same way. And my mom was a great cook. And she thought it was crazy. And it's funny, all these years later, now my, my, a lot of my family are, eat, are eating this way. Everyone's coming around. Yeah. Now. Yeah. It's nice that it's, that it's changing. So, um, but it's so understandable when, because we were taught a certain way. We were, you know, this is this was our childhood. This is the smells from our childhood. Hey, Uncle Billy's making burgers on the barbecue. Right. And you know, it's it's hard to break that. So how it did really you? Is. How did you go from non-vegan to vegan? How did you make that switch? Was it right away? I think um, I always tell a story. I ate pizza, pretty much breakfast, lunch, and dinner for a week, mm. and it kind of coincided with I, I I had to get some blood work done. And my cholesterol was very high. And I told the doctor, I said, I don't, I don't want to eat animals anymore. And he's like, well, what have you been eating? I was like, a lot of pizza. And he said, you know, the dairy is going to just keep pushing your cholesterol up. So it was really just a matter of like, all right, screw it. I'm just, mm. just going to become vegan. And I just remember one day I was out to dinner and the words just kind of came out of my mouth. And everyone was looking like, what's, you know. Because uh, vegetarian is scary to a lot of people. And then when you go vegan... It's that extremism that right. scares the hell out of people. Well, they st my friends started questioning everything. Like, right. are, you know, are you still heterosexual? Yeah, right. why? I mean, nothing's yeah. changed. It's like, I just don't want to eat animals anymore. But see, that's interesting because it, it, it's interesting how sexuality comes into everything. Right. I mean, you know, you went to Angelica's and you fell in love with the waitress. And, right. and now all of a sudden you're a vegan. How did that happen? Right. You know, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting how people will question um, sexuality when it comes to food but in reality what you learn is that when you become a vegan you become more energetic and more sexual and more Absolutely. powerful and more you know you know more 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 right that's what happens but it's but sorry sorry to cut you off so no, anyway I, you, you bring up a good point yeah um especially in the sense and and you know in the in the 20 22 plus years that i've been doing this i've seen it change a lot but being vegan was always perceived as a weakness. So when you talk about sexuality, it was like if you're a dude and you're you're not eating meat, like that somehow you you're more effeminate or that you're less of a man. Right, and it's the opposite because you know what I've found out in my life is that the more someone seems macho, the more insecure they are. Right, and the more someone is vulnerable, the more of a man they are. The more the right. you know, and it's it's and people are shocked by that, but it's. It turns out to be the truth. When I was growing up, there would you know that sort of machismo that came in there. It always felt false. It always right. felt empty. And uh, you know, and again, I always say, you know, you can tell the vegans from the uh, meat eaters at Thanksgiving because the meat eaters are sleeping on the couch and the vegans are doing the dishes. Right. Yeah, <laughs> because they still have the energy. That's true. And people, a lot of comedians make jokes about you know how many vegetarians are. You can't raise your hand, or you're tired, or that kind of thing. <laughs> 
But I, when you go to a vegan restaurant, I don't know if you ever was at Pure Food and Wine back in the day. Sure, yeah. It was the most energetic place in the world. You come here to the Organic Grill, the noise in here is so, because we're blah, 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 I'm talking and loud. And, right. and so it's funny how people perceive and this perception and this negativity that people put out there. Right. You know, when you make fun of someone's sex or say you're weak because you're doing this, immediately as a human being you're like wait a second you know i eat meat i eat burgers you know then you come to the organic grill and have a triple j and right. you go oh my god <laughs> exactly. i'm ready for sex <laughs> right now it's it's um and and like i said i don't think we have that issue anymore especially now that we have all these ultra endurance athletes right um all these bodybuilders very good friend of mine jeff palmer is 57 he's four years older than i am and he's in amazing shape so it's like, oh, yeah, or and then John Joseph, our friend, right. you know, former um, uh, mixed martial artist right. and is an Iron Man. Ten it's times, like, hey, do me yeah. a favor. You know, why don't you just tell me about being less a man? Go tell John Joseph and, yeah, see, and right. see, see where you end up in that, you know. <laughs> Uh, and there's a new movie that friends of mine uh, uh, put together, a documentary called Game Changers. Mm. And it's yeah. about all these absolutely amazing professional athletes. In fact, they, they do follow at one point the Tennessee Titans. The whole offensive line yeah. went vegan. And they like set all records, all sorts of records for for that team. Athletic that performance, that yeah. athletic performance, right? And that's imp incredible because I remember Cecil Fielder, the baseball player, went vegan, and then his career was kind of he wasn't hitting the ball well. It's just because he got older and whatever. Right. But they were like, he should eat meat, right? You know, but hopefully people will. Wait, was it Cecil attitude. or was his son Prince? Um, I think Cecil. The f oh, maybe uh, Prince. You're right. right. You're right. Right. His son Prince Cecil's right. son. Yeah. Right. So uh, if Cecil had did it, that would have been because that was back that in was my back, time, yeah, our time, right. in the '70s. So, right. um, so yeah, it's changed, and right. we've been able to finally change that perception. And it's so interesting, you know. My nieces, um, they're not vegan, and I've tried over the years. In fact, I think I had I was I had my my sister in law put the kibosh on like when they were three, and they were asking me like, Uncle Peter, why aren't you eating chicken wings? Right. And I told them where it came from, and they started crying. And my sister in law was like, I need you know don't. Yeah, Stop. don't do that, I know. You know, but now all of a sudden, like, Beyonce starts posting stuff, and now my 21-year-old niece is like, hey, Uncle Peter, like, can you tell me more about... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can. You know, so it's it's changing, and it's absolutely made, and, and the changes now are happening exponentially. Yeah, which is great. Now, let me, let's go back with one step. So, people are telling me, and uh, now, that it's a, vegan is great, it's good, but it's important to have, like, beef bone broth, because that will help your collagen. Now, what, how does that come about? How, you know, do you find, in, in the days that you were not vegan, did you think that beef bone broth was really healthy for humans? And has that changed? Um, well, being, you know, talking about doing the veal stock, you know, I, I used to make it all the time. And I knew that it was, I mean, there was a lot, it was a lot of gelatin in there. Right. Um, I know people who used to eat jello a lot for their hair and their nails and things like that. But... Um, no, again, I don't think you need animal products at all to, to not only sustain life, but to, to have vitality. Right. And the reason why I'm asking that, you know, we're, we're preaching to the choir. Everyone who eats like us, right. you know, they're going to go, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But it's the people who are, have these questions like, well, you know, should I, maybe if I just have beef bone broth, I'll be okay. Well, I think the, the reason why people are gravitating towards that is that it's, it's a high in mineral content and... Yes, there's collagen and uh, protein in right. there too, but you can get those from from other sources. Right now, what I always wondered, and I mean, you may might know this, you might know this, Vlad, is that if you're getting animal protein, you're getting protein from an animal, and that animal is dead. Is that isn't that protein dead? Does uh, it, does protein hang out in a dead animal for years and years if you freeze it? it ha you know. Yeah, protein. From what I from what I understand, especially like in you know, uh, it's interesting. Never never looking at it that way, like that it's dead. Um, and then you know, of course, of course, working at high end restaurants where they have you know dry aged Angus right. beef, where it's basically rotting the meat, like right. a controlled rotting of the of the product. Um, the cooking process and things like that um, only destroy. Uh, water soluble vitamins and micronutrients gotcha. so minerals and protein do stick do around stick around yeah. okay because i would think that you know like anything it disintegrates 
as time. You know, someone said, well, some vegan person said, well, if you want to eat meat and get the best out of it, you got to kill the animal right then and drink the blood immediately. Well, and I mean, then, that's what the that's what that's what other predators, you know, animal predators do in the wild, and that right. is the best because you are getting, you know, they're getting the full complement of of all the enzymes and, and the everything. micronutrients you said that right. are gone after a short time. But on some levels, and I'm certainly not advocating dry Angus beef, but it's like because the same thing is like with fermenting uh for instance tempeh is a better source of protein than tofu and right. that's because it's it's, it's been the protein's yeah. been uh, broken down a little bit right, so i would think that on some, right because it's, it's processed tofu is processed isn't right it, and, and so is and so is tempeh it's just that mm. the tempeh is fermented whereas the tofu is not i got gotcha. you so it's the it, it it breaks down certain um enzymes that allow the protein to be uh, absorbed more more readily right and what would you tell other meat eaters who maybe maybe one day a week try being vegan or and how and see how that what would you tell your friends who were thinking about becoming vegan and because again this is that's the people we need to talk to absolutely um i would say i mean i i've said for a year well it's interesting now that i'm working for a a fish free company for years i used to tell people switch to fish first Mm. Figuring like that's got to be a healthier source than animal protein, not realizing how badly we've destroyed the oceans. Right. Um, that it's probably better. And again, certainly not advocating it. But if you knew like a local farmer and it was an organic farm, at least there's more variables that can be controlled. Whereas you don't know where this tuna swam. It's it swam hundreds and hundreds and thousands of miles. And what it's picked up along the way. Plastics and mercury. Plastic and, and mercury and all sorts of other chemicals that right. we've destroyed this planet with. So, um, But I would definitely suggest doing one day a week. And the nice thing, too, especially working for a company that's, that's making um, plant-based food convenient and easy, there are so many options. Back when I became vegan, it was uh, Boca Burgers. Mm-hmm. And a few others. I mean, Fake and Bacon from Light Life, which is still around, thank God, because it's amazing. But there weren't that many options. There weren't that many vegan restaurants. So now you see vegan restaurants in almost every major city. Now you can get products like Good Catch in every Whole Foods across the country. Right. You, can go, you can go to um, Burger King eventually, now in Florida, but Burger King eventually, and get a, a, a meat-free Whopper. Right. Uh, Carl's Jr. We went when we we did uh, Expo West out in in um, in Anaheim last year, and we I think we spent like a hundred and forty dollars. We just got e like every uh, uh, Beyond Meat burger that they had. Right. So there's so many more convenient <laughs> ways to do this that you don't really have an excuse. Right. And, and I so heard, you I could heard... start that way maybe is to say start with the convenience foods. Um. Yes, they're processed, but use that i mean you're going to get the texture the te the flavor you're going to hit all those umami notes all those cravings that you have right do that for a while and then see how you feel and if you feel like wow you know what i don't miss meat anymore well th th now now we've got you now now you now you've seen for yourself hey i can i can do this this is not that hard right i've heard you talk about the impossible burger and how it's you know if you're going to do it do it once in a while and why is that is because the makeup of what it no, no. I was saying, like, for people who want to, who want to, uh, who want to switch, right? To say, like, do it once a week. I see. So what it's you're like, saying. you know, go out and get an Impossible uh, he's Burger. He's talking about now. that it's still a processed food. So don't, don't uh, focus on this as an alternative. Right. Just use it uh, f if you feel craving, yeah. craving for the, for the meat. And uh, I heard that Good Catch has been called like Impossible. Yeah, a lot of impossible people are calling fish. us. Yeah, the Impossible, uh, you know, burger. or the Beyond Meat, and I well welcome all those because you know if and when which i think is more when not if right uh we go public i would love to have that same kind of performance on and Wall it's Street. also um that over the years of uh, evolving of vegan cuisines there was such a tremendous focus on meat replacements but not so much on on fish and right. sea uh, uh, products right well that's true i mean um my buddy chad uh, sarno started this company right and he and i are like brothers and we've been working together for about 13 years. Right. And both he and I were always working on meat analogs, right. cheese analogs. Right. In fact, I learned the, from him, and we have some, some similar items right. here, um, 
the fermented cashew cheese. Yes. So lots of things I learned from him, and we were always working in that space. And then I remember about a little bit more than two years ago, I met him in the city, and with him, it's always amazing. He was always this magnet for like innovation, and you know, my conversations with Chad would be on the phone, and like, and I'd be like, what? Like, you're doing what? Um, so he tells me, like, I think we cracked the code for tuna. He's like, you have to come check this out. So a month or two later, was at the Fancy Food Show here at the Javits. Right. It's the first time I had it. Tasted amazing. I knew it would taste great because anything that Chad has done has always been... What has he done before? Chad actually was the global director at Whole Foods uh, when they did their Health Starts Here uh, yeah. uh, program. He opened up a bunch of vegan restaurants. I had the pleasure of working with him in uh, Munich for one of them. Uh, these restaurants called SAF, S-A-F. Which yeah, I went vegan. to one in London. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that was it the... Was, it's was great. Yes. So that was that's Chad. Um, and yeah, t- tons of other projects that we've done um, over the years. So uh, he was also the head of the plant-based culinary education at Ruby, which is a, a massive online culinary uh, pr- uh, platform. But let me ask you a question. I know you for a long time, and I know how uh, seriously you check all the projects that you want to be involved with. And we always discuss it, and you tell me that uh, uh, my integrity is the only thing I don't want to uh, jeopardize. Right. I want to be hundred percent sure that I'm doing the right thing so why good catch why not not another company why do you feel like uh, good catch is the company that you want to put your effort in that it's worth your time that it's uh, really something you want to dedicate yourself to because it's not uh, just one year you're working there you've been working it's with been, them. yeah it's been it's been from the beginning so yeah. about two years that's a that's a really good question um, I think part of it is Like I said, when Chad first told me that, I was like, that's brilliant. No one was looking at fish. No one's looking at fish. And it's probably one of the first things I ever learned how to make. I mean, I could have been eight years old, and um, my mom showed me, like, this is how you open up a can of tuna, and there's always a jar of Hellman's in the fridge. So um, there's a a very strong emotional connection to the product. And it's done in a way that it's almost like uh, tells you what to do with it. There is no uh, second thoughts, like, what are you going to do? You're going to open it and you... you right, these are ready to roll right out of right. the package. Yeah. These and here, we have tons of recipes online. So, in right. fact, the one that we're going to try later is a deli-style tuna salad using the... Okay, the so the, the product was wonderful and the idea was Right, great. the product is wonderful. But and then what the, about the, the company? The company it? itself, okay, so um, I've worked, like I said, I've worked with Chad for 13 years and... I mean, we've talked, uh, we've talked a lot about some of the, the, the hiccups I've had. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that w- was my naivete, I guess, not realizing like vegans are people too, <laughs> is that I would get involved in a business with someone and say like, the dude's vegan. He's going he's gonna to treat me solid. I, I come correct with integrity and, and I'll give 100%. They're going to give me 100%. Not realizing that the vegan community is a subset and we have our shysters and our knuckleheads yeah. and our crazy people. So, um, and you so think with this working company with, is different. It's 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 very different. Like I said, working with Chad for the last thirteen years, um, not only did we connect as as brothers, but as far as colleagues, um, always treated me with respect. Um, he always, you know, he, when he said something, he delivered on it, and it's always been above board and integrity from the very beginning. Then, so with this company, uh, with Chris Kerr who is one of the, you know, he's one, he, he doesn't want the spotlight at all, but he mm. is a vegan superhero. He's the head of New Crop Capital. And if it wasn't for people like Chris diverting massive, you know, millions and millions of dollars of investment into this space, we wouldn't be having these conversations. Right. So, um, and he is another person with, you know, impeccable integrity and just, you know, these are the vegans that I was always looking for. This is the right. company that if I had been like, I always tell Chris, where were you 22 years ago when yeah. I wanted to start a company? So this is like, the, the, if I was going to do a company, this this would be it. What, what impressed me personally is that it started with chefs. It didn't start like with huge like public companies that assigned it to a lab 
or food technologists to create a recipe. It's old school people who we know as chefs, right? Uh, right who started it and do it old school, grassroots marketing, uh, basically bringing people from community to support the project. Yeah, it's all OG. Right. Yeah. 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 And I also uh, <laughs> admire, and I know it about you, like everything you do, uh, is an overkill like uh, like if you are to prepare uh, the the f the dish it has to be you and i know chat is very particular about it uh, uh if you if you guys are doing sampling it has to be done properly it has to be done by certain people uh, uh when in fact it's probably be okay with just a cook from kitchen would do it but you guys taking pride and taking taking effort and time to do it right and it's also because you want to be there when it happens because it gives you new ideas it gives you new feedback you want to improve the product you always want to be in the forefront of what what actually happens you want to talk to customers you want to talk to chefs like i know when you were here you were looking feedback um, and it's very because yeah, you were moment. here at this restaurant mm -hmm. during the time that it was not all vegan and right. I know that you wanted it to be vegan. Mm -hmm. And then John Joseph, our all mutual mm -hmm. friend. And, uh, you know, Vlad's story is amazing about his mom and the history and talks Absolutely. about other mm -hmm. things and how it's become vegan. And, and there's an integrity here. And I'll say it with him sitting here and I could lie, but it's the, there's integrity involved. Right. And the same thing with the kind of food we eat or how we eat, what kind of humans we are and decide to eat, don't eat the animals anymore. There's all that integrity that's involved and we're happy that we have the you know a company and people like chad and derek and again i don't know how the cameras are going we'll sh we'll cut this later or whatever that these folks and yourself um are putting together these kind of packages so that people can easily eat this way and then the next step is also you were saying where you're going to have it like in a deli platter where you can make sandwiches out of it, and it wouldn't come this way in a package. It Correct. Would, so, so how would that um, work? And thank you for, for, for that, too, earlier, talking about, you know, that, that's, we are a chef-forward company. Right. And I think especially that we're still new at this, um, we do want to curate the, the tastings, you know. So, I, I mean, I trust Richard, you know, implicitly back there, but when, when, I, when we do the burgers, I want to make yeah, the fish burgers, I want to make sure your product. we do it. And then that's also going to become very big part of what you're, what you're alluding to is for, as far as food service. There would be a huge push on training. So going to large corporations, you know, going to Whole Foods, for instance, and, and meeting with their global team to say, you know, these are, I mean, obviously – you know we can't really control what happens once the customer right. buys it but to help them along with the with the product and but let's talk it. about present like i know that it was a world uh, plan based conference what what is the reaction of uh, people what uh, i know that you guys uh, got some accolades and you you got some awards talk about that well, we everywhere we've been. Now, this was obviously friendly territory. I mean, right. everybody coming in there, we didn't have to convince. I mean, unless someone had a soy allergy or something like that. Right. So, it's wildly successful. In fact, at one point, I had to go do a demo. So I was away from the booth for about an hour, and we had just started putting up our sliders, which we're going to be doing. Um, I'll be I'll be doing for you. There was almost a riot at the booth. Like there were so many people leaning on the booth that the booth started to shake, and then like someone like knocked, uh, like they couldn't reach the thing, and there were napkins. And they, they were like, like soccer the, hooligans, and they yeah, were like they pushed <laughs> napkins over, and we were putting up trays of like fifteen burgers each, and some lady just came and, and tried to walk away with the whole tray. Of so, course. Um, and this is the response that we get everywhere we go. So even when it's not a vegan show, and we're going to, for instance, like we just did the National Restaurant Show in Chicago, right. We were very apprehensive about that because they were also going to, that's a very chef forward show. So we knew that there were going to be a lot of chefs coming up being very skeptical. And I would say 99% of them, we, we win them over. And again, we're winning them over with the flavor, with the texture. Right. It wasn't really until our food scientists came on board to get that flake. I mean, we probably did, I think I had done a, uh, I know for Organic Avenue, I did a mock tuna with walnuts and and dulse and it tasted great but you weren't fooling anybody right, right. you know right. i think we used to do like a mashed right. chickpea yeah. with the 
with the Nori, which so is a classic. So did you class. guys get any awards, like official awards for the testing? Um, we've won Best in Show at Expo East. We wow. won. Um, so there's so many products on that show. Wow. And the amazing thing is, like, they never gave that award to someone who we hadn't even launched yet. That uh, was like two years. You don't years even ago. have products right. uh, available. Yeah, they didn't right. even have none awards of, yet. From they what just, what just, they <laughs> give you a piece of fish <laughs> and what chuck I it in your mouth. You, none of the <laughs> restaurants are serving it yet, right? No. So, um, so we launched with these three products back in February. And they are in. They were in Whole Foods nationwide. I believe that exclusive um, contract end, ended in June, mm -hmm. uh, June first. So you're going to start seeing these in a lot of stores. I think Orchard Grocer, our friends down um, down in the uh, Lower East Side, they're carrying it. But you're going to start seeing it in large and, uh, supermarkets. You well. guys are so confident in in your success and productions that you are building a plant now right yes we're building a, a massive plant and that's when we're going to start doing food service so food service gotcha. will be slightly different than uh, it is here it'll be in what they call a saddle bag so it's three pounds oh, wow. on each side and it's uh hpp'd and frozen nice so, so it'll right, have great shelf right. life and it's 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 an amazing protein to, so what, to what are the other plans uh, for the products well, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna do the sliders. Yeah, why That's don't we, part of why don't our frozen. We do that. Why don't we? Bring out some of the food. Never sure. say no to food. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's well, what that's right. what we're we'll here for. We'll bring that out. You want to br get them to bring some yeah, out? We sure. can have it. Uh, I could do it real quick. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, now this is more. It's the most of the exciting part. Yes, <laughs> this is when you all get that to other eat stuff. The food. Nah. All the other stuff. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> new Rochelle. Eh. <laughs> now I want new food, and we have new food. <laughs> right. So Peter, exp explain what we have here. Okay, so what we have here is an example of our deli style tuna. The recipe is uh, on our website. It's an amazing recipe, very simple. It's veginase, Dijon mustard, horseradish, uh, capers, fresh dill, fresh parsley, celery, and green onion, and a little bit of lemon zest. And that was basically using the tuna packed in water. So this is very, very, this is how I learned something similar to prepare tuna and enjoy tuna. So again, it's very simple. You buy the package, you follow the recipe online, mm -hmm. and boom, you have deli style tuna we usually serve it with these really nice thin crisp uh caraway crackers and then here we have our fish burger this will be part of our frozen line that we are shooting for an october launch oh wow um so this is a white fish analog for lack of a better word so mm -hmm. just think of like a flaky white fish burger and we have uh, this, a crab cake and then a thai uh, spiced version of this that will be launching uh, I don't know who our launch partner is yet, but again, and that will be an October launch, and these will be frozen. Ah, okay. The sm they smell great, which is really great. And you should have seen how it sizzled on the grill. Wow, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, that was... Look at that. Yeah, they're... I'm they're, gonna touch it, but I'm gonna eat it. So. That's yours, yeah. <laughs> you touch and then, it, you um, eat it. That's the way funny. we serve this, so like going back to talking about how Chad wants to make sure... Uh, the way we the way we always serve this, it has to be a squishy bun. Eddie, take oh, it please. easy. He manja, didn't manja. finish. <laughs> um, I'm it's got to be a squishy bun, and we also make a really really nice horseradish uh, tartar oh. sauce with fresh dill and shallots. How many so, different sauces do you have, or do you do you have do you sell them as well the sauces? No, but that's that's coming down the pike. It just the, these are so popular. That's the yes, easiest part, right? It. Well, not the easiest part, but it's like, right? But it, it's uh, that's definitely something we're we're looking to to have our own sauce line as well. So then it'll be really simple. You just get this, uh -huh. go buy the sauce, mix one and two, and that's it. Very now, simple. how do you get the taste and the texture and the smell? Those kind of things. How does you know good catch do that? How, like you were talking about the algal oil earlier and the right, which I don't know if actually we that might have been before we, we before uh, we started before yeah. we started right. So I'm going to start eating. You talk, please. Yes, enjoy. So right. um, essentially, just to go back a little bit, this product is mm. made from a proprietary blend of six different legumes. So we have pea, chickpea, soy, lentil, fava, and navy bean. Mm. And then we use algal oil. So as we were talking about, fish get their fishy flavor or flavor of the ocean from eating algae. Right. So what did you say? Skip the middle fish? Yeah, yeah. So the cut out guy, the middle fish. Cut out the middle people fish. People say, why don't, you know... Why don't you eat fish? You'll get this uh, oil, this, uh, I forget what they call it, the three, omega-3. Omega-3, right. Right, I go, well, why don't I eat what the fish eat, which is the seaweed, the seaweed salads, right. and cut out the middle fish. Exactly. So we cut it. out the middle fish. We went right to the algae itself to get 
the nutrition, but it also helps us dial in a clean ocean flavor. Some of the original um, iterations, we were using an unfiltered oil, mm -hmm. and it was very, very fishy. Ah. So, um, and what we found is that people don't necessarily, they like tuna fish, but they're not that crazy if it's like super, super fishy. So I think we've achieved yeah, the perfect balance. Some people balance. don't even eat it because of it, right? Right, I mean, we, in, in some of the research we did, there's people that that don't even like tuna, but it's a very convenient, you know, like put a, put a pouch in your gym bag and it's like, right. you, know, you just come out of the gym, boom, you get 15, 16, 17 grams of protein. Right. But, you know, they're eating it holding their nose almost, so yeah. to speak. So I think we've really um, achieved a really nice balance between- So how is this is comparing to regular tuna in terms of protein? Okay, protein, we are um, equivalent to albacore. Whoa. And that was what we were shooting for. And we knew it was gonna happen because it's because of the, the legumes, it was gonna be very high in protein. So wow. you get your protein. So that is covered, right? Like whoever protein wants to and try your, and your yeah, DHA is, 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 yeah. is absolutely covered. And like we always say, we left out the mercury, we left out the microplastics, <laughs> we left out all the chemicals. So it's a, it's a really wonderful product. They're great right out of the bag. Right. The Mediterranean style has roasted bell pepper, fresh oregano, wow, nice. which is really nice. And then the oil and herbs is a traditional way that it's served in Europe, like places like Spain and Italy, mm -hmm. with, um, with extra virgin olive oil and some chives and oregano in that as well. That's great. So we're what do you feed, think? We're, it's phenomenal. It's delicious. And I'm not, I mean, I could easily say it because we're here and you're here, and, but it really is delicious. And it tastes just like tuna. Right. And the texture, like you said, is just like tuna. Um, right. That's really the, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a slam dunk. I mean, if it just tasted good, ah, oh, that'd be great. That's great. You know, if, if the protein was there and you could get it instead of eating, oh, that's great. But to have the look and the appearance, the texture, the mouthfeel, the way it flakes apart, because that's the that's, part of the emotional appeal. Also, Absolutely. The yeah. important part is, uh, I think, that it kind of goes along with all the products that are similar uh, lines in supermarkets. Like, we are all craving uh, to go to a regular supermarket and just buy good stuff that is good for you. Right. That is on a level, okay? Not necessarily uh, that you have to go to a health food store and buy this exquisite, exclusive products uh, that cost like three t times more just because you open the door with a, with a, uh, with a cliche organic and health store right. right so people can go to the store and it's a familiar look i mean obviously it's not the same look but familiar idea and you don't have to think twice you right. just know that it's plant based you buy it you use it and maybe you uh, if you are not vegan you can put it right next to your tuna and what <laughs> right once in a while right. just right. to kind of get a feeling that it's nothing superior Okay. Right, and you're getting all the nutrition and the nutrients yeah, that, you, that you crave, that your body needs. That's the important thing. Right. I so mean, we, I think we've really, we've, we've just, got, we, unfortunately, we've got to a point in human history where, I mean, 22 years ago when I first started doing this, I would say, hey, live and let live. Like, if you want to eat meat, that's fine. But we're at a point now that it's not sustainable in terms of keeping all these animals here for the growing population. And again, if the, if the oceans were pristine, fish would still be a relative, I mean, forget about the fact that they feel pain and, and all the these other things. Right, right, the yeah. the effort and the money goes to this, even to right. get this uh, Right, and then all the other collateral damage, like yeah. you're, you're fishing for tuna, you're killing dolphins. You right. Know? It's, so, uh, and you know, global warming and you know, right. the, the heat and in the seas. And it's not controllable, and imagine this factory is just producing the same amount of fish that you <laughs> that you mm -hmm. need to have it's from true. the ocean. Right. And so before we feed this the, the crew and ourselves, yes. I just want and uh, two things. First I want to thank um, you know Good Catch for uh, presenting this and, and letting you come along and talk about this and sharing this great news with us. We get to meet you and know a lot about you. And, Thanks uh, for having and, me. And what's next for you? What's and next? we should say uh, hello and thank you to Sarno Brothers too. Absolutely, yeah. yes. And, and if, they were, if they weren't busy, uh, yeah. Derek is actually stationed in London. They're, they're, they're caught on the back of the, the package. They can't get here. <laughs> yes, they can't get out. Uh, they would have loved to have been here uh, as well. And Because the Organic Grill, this is the place where That's actually people come where from all over. That's actually on Sunday, right? After right, the show. I bought them they both in here for right Sunday. Before Catching the flies, that was so nice. We yeah. had brunch together. And that's one of the, you know, why I'm even here. It's like, this is where everyone comes, the organic grill. And Absolutely. has some of the greatest 
food in the world. So the combination of good catch, you know, I'm spoiled. And now if it's tuna, we just unbeatable. Yeah. It's yeah. True. When we start doing the food service, you'll be uh, this. And, and th that's another nice thing about this product, too, is that it cooks very well. Uh, so, yeah. for instance, at, at trade shows, we've done a pasta with a, with a white wine wow. butter tuna sauce, which is really nice. We've done fri um, a Thai curry. Like a red Thai yeah, curry that's up with my with, alley, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's it holds up really well. So the applications that once we go with food service, which is hopefully October, October November, you'll be able to start creating so tuna thank casseroles. You very much. Yeah. Slowly. So so lastly, what what's next for you? Uh, next, we uh, I think our next big show is Expo East in Baltimore, and. That's really it. It's it's really just um, supporting the company wherever I can, and then hopefully getting into the kitchen to start iterating, you know, new products. That's one of the big things that they want to see is like what's what's next. Okay, and if great. If you want to know what's next for me, I'm just gonna eat those. those yeah, that's <laughs> yes, please. I know, and we yeah. want to feed the crew too. So. Absolutely. So thank you very much for your such a pleasure. Same here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you, brother. That's OG talk for this. See you next time. Mm -hmm.